All right. Um, I think today we will just cover section 9.6, which is on the ratio and the root tests. And that'll get us through the, um, the major uh, convergent and divergent uh, portions of the chapter, 9.2 through 9.6. Um, I think that'll be a good way to wrap up the week. Um, and then start with power series next week. So. So, section 9.6, ratio and root test. These are actually very similar tests. Once we uh, calculate our limit, because it's going to, as you, as it turns out, a lot of these are based on limits. Um, but as we calculate our limits, the conclusion is the same in both cases, depending on the outcome of the limit. The, the set of conclusions we can draw is identical. Uh, the only difference is how we get there, which is the, the big change from, from one test to the other. Focus. Good. There we go. <laughs> so, um, continuing with this, um, let me go with the ratio test. And so let uh, the sum of a sub n be a series with non-zero terms. Calculate L is equal to the limit as N goes to infinity of the absolute value of A N plus 1 over A N. And so the series One, it converges uh, if L is less than one. Two, it diverges if L is greater than one. And is inconclusive if L is equal to 1. Okay. So, the main thing we have to do here is calculate this limit and then determining what happens from there is actually pretty straightforward. We just have to pick, you know, is L less than 1, greater than 1, or equal to 1? It won't be negative. There's no way it's going to be negative because it has a, a absolute value expression here, and we have non-zero terms. So um, it will be a positive number. It's just a question of how positive, I guess. 
Uh, now, when we say it's inconclusive if L is equal to 1, in that case, uh, in this section at least, we can stop. But in general, if we're trying to find if a series converges or diverges, that means we'll have to try some other approach if we get a value of 1 for our limit. So it just depends on the, on the series that we're working with. Now, a n plus 1 versus a n. So a n is just the expression in here. Now a n plus 1, we take this expression and replace each n with n plus 1 to get this expression. Um, and one thing we'll notice is that we may start off with an alternating series where it has like negative 1 to the n. But when we take the absolute value, that will get rid of those alternating terms because we know the result will always be positive 1 or for those values. Okay, that, that's really the crux of the ratio test right there is just being able to calculate this limit. A lot of times, and it's just like what we saw in previous sections, a lot of times we will have to, to use uh, either L'Hopital's rule or our shortcut that we talked about in a little more detail last time uh, as far as determining those limits. So let's look at some examples. Um, also, before we move on, sorry, um, when we would normally use the ratio test, when it would be the best test to use, it's typically when we have expressions with more than one type of uh, term present. By that I mean polynomial, exponential, factorial, more than one of those types present in the expression, in the, in the summation. So, so we frequently use um, the ratio test. when we have at least two of the following. Present in A sub N. So we have a polynomial exponential and factorials. I don't know if there's other types we need to worry about. Let me look at some of the examples real quick. Just get this sheet of paper. Normally it's combinations of these types of things that we, we really have to be concerned about how they interact with each other. Um, yeah, that's, that's essentially what we're looking at here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, polynomials, exponentials, and factorials. If we have at least two of those present in the expression, then it's a safe bet that the ratio test is the way that we want to proceed. And that's one of the things we kind of want to start focusing on a little bit more is, is how to know when we can use certain tests. And that's, I think it's especially important in section six here, knowing when to use the ratio and the root test. You know, it's pretty obvious when something is geometric or when something is a p-series. Uh, when something is an alternating series, we, we can recognize those. Um, but it turns out, uh, for an alternating series, we can use the ratio test just as well. Uh, but if it's inconclusive, then we have to go back to the normal alternating series test. So that, that's the thing we have to watch out for. Um, but then we also had like the integral test, we had uh, the nth term test. Those are a little bit more 
problematic as far as recognizing when we can use those. Integral tests in particular, I'm, when it comes time to do our exam on this topic, I will uh, make sure to indicate when, you know, which problem I would like you f to do the integral test on. But for the other questions, it'll be open-ended. You'll have to figure out which test to use and then uh, proceed to utilize that test and, come and arrive at a conclusion of convergent or divergent based on that. So it will be a little bit more challenging when we get to an exam. That's why I wanted to make sure we spend at least a day reviewing this topic uh, before we have an exam. Um, and it's still a few weeks from now. So it'll be probably right before Thanksgiving, honestly. Um, round about there. So anyway, uh, continuing. Um, it, may, it may be the, the, the Thursday before Thanksgiving. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. Alright, um, so that's when we use the ratio test, but now we, we have a, a list of problems in the textbook where they specifically ask us to, to utilize the ratio test and see what we can do with it. So this is on page 637. Let's look at number twenty. Where the sum n equals zero to infinity of two to the n over n plus two factorial. Okay. So that means a sub n is 2 to the n over n plus 2 factorial. Now we notice that we have an exponential term on top and a factorial on the bottom. So that goes along with what we said before. We have two different of those types of terms. So we can utilize the ratio test for sure in this. Even if, it's, even if we weren't told to use the ratio test, that's the one that we would have to use here. Unless for some reason it doesn't come up, it comes out to be a limit of one, and in which case we'll just have to guess at what else to use. I don't know what else to use besides that, so it should just be a, a ratio test. So, um, probably do some kind of, uh, I don't know what else would work off the top of my head. Sorry. Um, that's a sub n, and so a n plus 1, that means everywhere that we have n, which is just those two places, let's replace n with n plus 1. So 2 to the n plus 1, and then n plus 2 becomes n plus 3 factorial. Okay. Now these are already positive terms, they're non-zero. So we don't have to take the absolute value, even though the absolute value is part of that limit formula. L equals limit n approaches infinity of a n plus 1 over a n inside the absolute value. Um, in this case, because they're already positive termed, uh, we don't have to worry about the absolute value. But that's the formula that we want to use here. Now, we're going to take a n plus 1 divided by a n. Now, we notice that both of these are fractions. So what we can do is we can take a n plus 1 first, because it is listed in the numerator. And we can instead multiply the reciprocal of a n, which is a uh, n plus 2 factorial over 2 to the n. Yep. 
So remember, dividing by a sub n means we multiply by its reciprocal. Just the same as we would do with any fraction. Um, now, the reason that the ratio test works here is because of our, or the way that our terms simplify. Anytime we have exponential and factorial terms, we can simplify these quite a bit. We can't really simplify the polynomial terms, but we at least we know what to expect with polynomial terms as far as their convergence or, or divergence, as far as the limit goes, basically. Um, sorry about that. Okay. So let's look at how we re reduce 2n plus 1 over 2n. Remember, if we have uh, the same base, we can just subtract the exponent, so it's just 2 to the first. Okay. So that means we can cancel these out, and we'll just have an extra 2 on the numerator. We subtract n plus 1 minus n, so the n's cancel, so we still have 2 to the first. Now the more challenging aspect here that students I know struggle with is n plus 2 factorial over n plus 3 factorial. And we talked about this a little bit back when we first looked at factorials, but uh, it, it is, like I said, a little, little bit more confusing of a topic for a lot of students, and that's okay. Uh, remember that the factorial is the product of everything from 1 to the number that we're taking the factorial of. So, n plus 2 factorial, <coughs> excuse me, n plus 2 factorial, is a product of all the numbers from 1 to n plus 2, and n plus 3 factorial is the product of all the numbers from 1 to n plus 3. We don't really know what n is, but uh, we expect it to be sufficiently large that we can easily work with it. Um, but the idea is that because we have factorials both on top and bottom, a lot of the things will cancel out here. In fact, all but one of the things will cancel out here. Because really, when you compare two factorials, you know, in a division expression like this, the whatever's left over is whatever or however f much further one goes than the other. So if this goes everything from one to n plus two, and this goes everything from one to n plus three. Let me uh, let me write this down separately. It is equal to one over n plus three, but I want to explain why. So we think of that as 1 times 2 times 3 all the way up to n minus 1 times n times n plus 1 times n plus 2. Okay. So we're just counting up by 1. Now we don't know what n is, but you know if we just keep adding 1, we start with n minus 1, add 1, we get to n, add 1, n plus 1 is the next term, add 1, n plus 2 is the next term. Same thing on the denominator, except this time we'll go all the way to n, minus, or n plus 3. What happens is all these things cancel out except this one. So we say it's 1 over n plus 3. And again, this one stops at n plus 2, this one goes one step further to n plus 3, so that's what's going to be left over. Everything up to n plus 2 will cancel on both of them, and then this one goes one step further to n plus 3, so we'll go. And, and that'll be what's left over, and it's on the denominator that we see that. Okay. So focusing on our limit once again, 
we know that we're going to have a 2 left on top. And an n plus 3 left on the bottom. Okay. Because we can cancel n plus 2 factorial over n plus 3 factorial and leaves that n plus 3 on the denominator. And a 1 on the, the numerator on the right. So now we can take our limit. And for this one, we go back to what we talked about last time, which is uh, if the numerator has a larger exponent, because this is now a polynomial or a rational expression of polynomials. If the numerator has a larger exponent, it goes to infinity. If the denominator has a larger exponent, it goes to zero. And if they have the same exponent, top and bottom, then it goes to the coefficient of those leading terms. And, uh, in this case, we just have a constant on top, which is technically a degree zero polynomial. And we have n to the first power on bottom. And so because we have a larger exponent on the denominator than the top, this will go to zero. In this case, we can also think of it as just being two over infinity if we actually try to plug in infinity. And then a, a small, you know, relatively small number two being divided by an infinitely large number, infinity is going to be so small it, it converges to zero as this denominator gets larger and larger. Okay. And so with L equal to zero, we go back to our interpretation of this, which is converges if L is less than one, diverges if L is greater than one, and inconclusive is equal to one. So we got a value of zero which means it converges by the ratio test. Okay, 24 next. With the sum, n equals 1 to infinity. Um, let's see, this is 6 to the nth power in the numerator, and n plus 1 to the third power in the denominator. Now this is a, a ratio of an exponential term and a polynomial term, which means it's, it's a good candidate for the ratio test with two different types of expressions in there. So that's a n, 6 to the n over n plus 1 fact, or cubed, sorry. And then a n plus 1 would be 6 to the n plus 1 over n plus 2 to the third. Because we would just add 1 to the n, which makes this one larger inside n plus 2. All right, so we want L equals the limit as n goes to infinity of a n plus 1 divided by a n. And again, we have the absolute value, but there's no alternating terms here, so we're okay. We don't need to put absolute value. All of our values are, neg are positive already, so there's no need for it. So we start with a n plus 1, 6 to the n plus 1 over n plus 2 to the third power, and then divide by a n, so we multiply by its reciprocal, n plus 1 cubed over 6 to the n. Now, we can reduce the exponential terms. We cannot reduce polynomial terms unless they're exactly the same term, okay? 
So when we have n plus 2 and n plus 1, those are considered two different terms, so we cannot reduce those at all. However, 6 to the n plus 1 over 6 to the n reduces to 6 to the first. So we'll just have an extra 6 in the numerator. So L equals limit and goes to infinity and we'll have 6 times n plus 1 cubed over n plus 2 cubed. Now let's multiply this out. Now what I mean is let's not multiply out the entire thing. Let's look at the what an expansion of this uh, this binomial cubed would start off as at least. We know if we take n plus 1 and cube that binomial, our first term will be n cubed. And we don't really worry about the rest because, as we learned from our shortcut, finding these limits, we only need the leading term, which is the first term. Okay. On the bottom, we still have n cubed. And, uh, you know, the rest of this polynomial will be a little bit different than the other because of the 2 instead of a 1. But again, the leading term, both are n cubed. Okay. So if we distribute our 6 now, we know the, the numerator is going to start off 6n cubed, plus whatever follows from that. And the denominator will be n cubed, plus whatever follows there. So when we calculate the limit of this, we notice that they have the same exponent. Both of them have n to the third power, which is fairly typical. Fairly typical if we don't have a factorial present. The factorial kind of screws this up and, and tilts things to one side or the other. Um, it doesn't screw it up, but it, it definitely skews things in a particular direction. Um, but otherwise, this is kind of what we tend to see. Same exponent, different coefficients, though. But remember, if we have the same exponent, then the limit is based on the coefficient of those terms. And because the coefficient is 6 over 1, then our limit is going to be 6. And again, going back to what we said before, converges if L is less than 1, diverges if L is greater than 1, and inconclusive L equals 1. The L's greater than 1 in this case because we got a value of 6 for L, so it's going to diverge. So because we ended up with a limit greater than 1, that means that it's going to diverge according to our ratio test. Let's look at 26. We have the sum, n equals 1 to infinity. We have negative 1 to the n plus 1 times n plus 2 over n times n plus 1. All right. Now we notice in this problem we do have an alternating term, negative 1 to the n plus 1. But again, let me point out, 
And when we do our ratio test, we take the absolute value of these terms. So what's going to happen is with taking the absolute value, essentially we're going to get rid of that negative 1 to the n plus 1. Okay. So we can say the absolute value of a sub n is n plus 2 over n times n plus 1. And then the absolute value of a n plus 1 is it'll be n plus 3 over n plus 1 times n plus 2. Again, we're adding 1 to each of our n's in the process. I'll make sure I do. There's another one I want to make sure I do to answer a slightly different question. Anyway, uh, so we want our limit L equals uh, limit A equals infinity. And again, we want to take A sub N plus 1 first. So N plus 3 over N plus 1, N plus 2. And we'll multiply by the reciprocal of a n, which is n times n plus 1 over n plus 2. Now, normally we can't cancel any polynomials. This is strictly a, a polynomial expression. So probably we could work this just as easy with alternating series tests. Although this may actually be easier. Um, depends how it turns out, actually. But uh, this may be easier because, you know, in an alternating series test, remember on, on Tuesday, we had to take this expression, a n, and basically find its derivative and show that the derivative is negative. Uh, which is a little bit more complicated when we have a quotient and we have to apply the quotient rule to get that derivative. So, alternating series tests may have some drawbacks in this particular case. Now we can cancel out the n plus ones. So we have one on top and one on bottom. Uh, n plus twos are next to each other, so we can't cancel those. Um, but that's the only thing that we can cancel here is we, we can't cancel n with anything because there's no other plain n expressions on the bottom because they with that number associated with it n plus 2 we can't cancel part of that without messing with the other part okay but now we can multiply across and put the rest of it together that we couldn't cancel so n plus 3 times n would be n squared plus 3n. And on the bottom, n plus 2 times n plus 2, that would be n squared plus 4n plus 4. Now, the limit of this, because we have the same exponent, top and bottom, we look at their coefficients, it's equal to 1. And so the ratio test is inconclusive as a result. So what we would probably do here is, is, like I was kind of talking about before, go ahead and just use the alternating series test instead. Um, if we actually want to, you know, test this con for convergence. Um, And the reason we want to use the alternating series test is because it is an alternating series because we have the negative 1 to the n plus 1 term here that makes it an alternating series. Okay. I'm not going to go through that again but uh, with, with the alternating series, but it should work out kind of nice. 
The only, the only trouble, like I mentioned before, would probably be the, the quotient rule and uh, demonstrating that it is negative, uh, in which it should turn out to be. It's just a matter of uh, going through the process. So. All right. Let's look at 30. With a sum n equals 1 to infinity of 2n in parentheses factorial over n to the fifth. So there's a sub n. Now a n plus 1, we have to be a little bit more careful here. The numerator, this will actually be 2n plus 2 factorial over n plus 1 to the fifth. The reason this goes from 2n to 2n plus 2 is we replace n with n plus 1 as we go to, to this term. But if we replace this with n plus 1, the 2 has to distribute to both of those terms. That's 2 times n and 2 times 1, which makes 2n plus 2. And that's where it's a little bit tricky sometimes, is when we have uh, not just n, but a number times n, it's going to have to distribute to both n and the 1 that we substitute in. So. In this example, I wanted to make sure that uh, this was demonstrated. Also, it's another opportunity to look at a factorial problem. Let's set up L. N plus 1 to the fifth. Then flip this one over so n to the fifth over 2n factorial. Okay. We know that we can't reduce the polynomial terms n5 over n plus 1 to the fifth. We can reduce vectorial terms always. So if we have um, 2n plus 2 factorial over 2n factorial. Now this is going to be the product of all the numbers from 1 to 2n plus 2. the numbers multiplied from 1 to 2n. So the bottom stops at 2n, but the top one keeps counting. 1 more than 2n is 2n plus 1. 1 more than that, 2n plus 2. So we're going to cancel all of these, and we'll have that left over. Okay. So for our limit, We'll still have 2n plus 1 and 2n plus 2. n plus 1 to the fifth on the bottom, and n to the fifth over 1 on the right. Thinking about the uh, multiplying this out, 
We could multiply these out. We know the first term is going to be 2n times 2n, which is 4n squared. 4n squared times n to the fifth is 4n to the seventh. So our numerator, we're going to start off with 4n to the seventh plus whatever follows beyond that. Because we have 2n times 2n times n to the fifth. That's going to be our leading term. On the bottom, our leading term will just be n to the fifth power. Okay. And so, we look at that, the, uh, the exponent is higher on the numerator than it is on the denominator. So this is going to go to infinity. And so our conclusion is it diverges by the ratio test. Again, anything bigger than one will make it diverge here. And then infinite, of course, it's extremely divergent. Okay, so what I wanted to cover in this problem in particular is if we do have like a 2n, for instance, it becomes 2n plus 2 when we substitute n equal uh, n plus 1 for n, like we have here. Now let's look at the root test. The root test is actually remarkably similar to the ratio test, at least in this interpretation. Um, so here, given uh, the sum of a n as n goes from zero to infinity or you know whatever number it starts at it doesn't have to be zero we want to find the nth root of a sub n and then l equals the limit as n goes to infinity of the nth root of a sub n Now, if L is less than 1, the series converges. Two, if L is greater than 1, the series diverges. Three, if L is equal to one, then the series or, or test is inconclusive. Okay. So it's actually the same conditions as we had for the ratio test. The only difference is this expression that we actually are taking the limit of inside. Dive into this. The first, the first example. Let, let's look at a geometric series. We already know how to solve a geometric series, whether it converges or diverges. And the rule is for a for a geometric series is if the ratio is between negative 1 and 1, it converges. If it's outside of that, then it diverges. 
And this one should converge because our ratio is one third. This absolute value of one third is less than one. But let's look at how the ratio test covers this because the, uh, sorry, the root test because the, the geometric series test is actually related directly to the root test. So if a sub n is equal to one third to the n, then the nth root of a sub n is one third. If we take the nth root, that knocks off the nth power. Those two cancel each other out. So it's just one third left over. This is the, a good example of a time that we would want to use this, this root test is when we have an expression raised to the nth power, taking the nth root takes away that nth power and just lets us work with whatever is inside. And then L would be the limit, and then goes to infinity of one third. We just take this value and plug it in. And because there is no N there to go to infinity, the result is still just one third, which is less than one. So it converges by the root test. We got the nth root of a sub n cancels out the nth power, so it's just a one third. The limit of one third is still one third, and that's less than one, so it converges. And that's true for any geometric series. If the geometric series converges, then the root test will converge. And if the geometric series diverges, then the root test diverges. The only exception is if we got uh, r equals one here. We know in the geometric series r equals one diverges. Whereas for the root test, it actually is inconclusive. So that's the only difference between the two. Otherwise, the geometric, geometric series is a special instance of the root test. All right. But the general approach here is kind of what we're talking about, is if something is raised to the nth power and we take the nth root, the, the power and the root cancel each other out. So we just have whatever is inside. And so if we have a more complicated term, that's especially helpful. Uh, for instance, on uh, 42, we have the sum n equals one to infinity of n minus two over 5n plus 1 to the nth power. So a sub n is n minus 2 over 5n plus 1 to the nth power. And if we take the nth root of that, the nth root cancels out the nth power. And so it's n minus 2 over 5n plus 1. And so we'll take the limit of that as n goes to infinity. Of uh, n minus 2 over 5n plus 1. And again, these have the same exponent, n to the first over n to the first. So we, their coefficients will be the limit, 1 over 5. So 1n over 5n is 1 fifth. Less than 1 converges. Okay. Root test is actually really easy to use most of the time. Um, let's see. Oof. Let's do 50. That one's a little bit different. Not a lot different, but a little bit different. Uh, limit as n equals one, uh, or <laughs> limit as n approaches infinity, sorry. I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. n equals one to infinity on the summation of natural log of n over n to the nth power. OK. 
Okay. So a sub n is natural log of n over n to the nth. So the nth root of a sub n is natural log of n divided by n. So L will equal the limit as n goes to infinity of natural log of n over n. Now, this is infinity over infinity. Okay. We don't have any rules that we can use when we have logarithms other than L'Hopital's rule. Now, we can't use our shortcut because it's not just a polynomial. But we'll use L'Hopital's. which says that we differentiate the top and the bottom separately from each other. So the derivative of natural log n is 1 over n, and the derivative of n is 1. Now, 1 divided by infinity, as n approaches infinity, 1 divided by infinity goes to 0. And we just have a 1 on bottom, so we get a result of 0. So L equals 0. That's less than 1, so it converges. Okay. So, m most, if not all of the time, that we see something raised to the nth power, it's either going to be 1, a geometric series, or 2, if, we, if it's not geometric, then we can use the root test instead. And that's, that's really nice to have. So. Okay. Let's look at some homework for this section. As I said before, we're on page 637. I did forget it, of course. I give you some ratio test problems and some root test problems. So ratio, let's look at 19, Probably that's sufficient there. And on the rate on, the, on the root test, sorry. Uh, go ahead and look at uh, my goodness. Uh, Thirty-nine, forty-one. Go ahead and try forty-three. That shouldn't be too bad. Okay. Now, one of the other things I want to show before we wrap this up, if you look on page 636, it has a list of all the tests that we have so far. Def defines how the series appears, the condition for convergence, condition for divergence, and any additional comments such as the nth term test can only be used to show divergence cannot show convergence. That's a really nice summary of the different tests that we've looked at so far. So if you want to look at that and start using it, I'll give you something similar to use on the exam whenever we get to that. So. Well, we've talked about all of these except for direct comparison. I instead just talked about limit comparison in section 4, I think it was didn't talk about direct comparison, so you can ignore that one, but just focus on limit comparison. All right, so that's all I have for us today. Um, we'll go ahead and stop there. So have a good weekend, and uh, we will continue on Tuesday next week starting Power Series, which is a little bit different topic. That's why I wanted to stop at the end of Section 6 here today. But power series is a, a little bit different topic. It uses some of the same concepts in, in section 9.7, but um, 
we inc start incorporate variables like x in addition to the ends that we already have for the power series or for the uh, the series. That's what makes the power series because it's the power of x. But uh, we'll we'll talk about that in a lot more detail next week. So y'all have a good one, and uh, I'll talk to you next time. Bye.